I Want to Jump Like Dee Dee with me, Giles Sibold, is the music podcast that does music a bit differently. I'm talking to some incredible musicians, DJs and producers about how they use an experimental mindset to fuel their own creativity, pursue new challenges, overcome fears, bounce back from mistakes. Okay, um, so I'm super excited today. My guest today is a musician, a photographer, a computer science grad, <laughs> publishing, creative director, and, and for me, a community builder. Um, she's always lived outside um, a comfort zone and lived a life pretty much DIY way, inspiring the revolution. It's a real pleasure to welcome Jennifer Finch today. Jennifer, <laughs> welcome and thank you so much for coming on. Revolutionary. It's wonderful, <laughs> isn't it? That's the thing. I never thought of myself like that. This, this is the, I mean, this is the great thing about... A, for me. This is the great thing about a kind of experimental podcast that, you know, it's a, it's a kind of excuse, great excuse to kind of get my favourite people on and just talk about experimental stuff. It's kind of like anything goes. Brilliant. Yeah, definitely. I didn't, I didn't, I only realized yesterday um, that you produced um, Brats on the Beat for St. Jude's. That is one of my favorite records. The Ramones of like my, were my kind of life-changing band, right? And that record I think is incredible. I love it. How old were you when you first heard the Ramones? I was, um, I was 11 when I first heard them. And I heard them. What was your, what was your entry album? My entry album was the was the first the first album. It was. It was. And the first the first record. Ironically, the first I didn't put the first track on the first album is obviously Blitzkrieg Pop. I didn't put that on. I put on for some reason Judy is a punk. Mm, it is a and punk. that was the one that record just kind of changed my life that was it I just became an obsessive after that that's so interesting yeah my babysitter came over when I was 11 and he brought the latest of everything that was released whatever year that was so my mm. entry was later like rocket to Russia maybe. okay yeah 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 I want to be sedated happy family mm. Evo's uncontrollable urge yeah offender you know i mean like really interesting it's everyone not it's like their second or third release yeah the yeah that wrote was is my favorite still is your favorite yeah so um and now i just listen to lady kaka over, <laughs> over all day long <laughs> well this is this is great i mean that was one of, the, one of the things that i was going to ask you is about different sort of music music genres but we'll we'll <laughs> we will kind of kind of come on to that. So I, um, I, I've been uh, a book uh, in sort of relation to you know kind of experimental mindsets and, and stuff. One what, a book that I read. Um, I don't know if you've read it. It's by Emma Gannon, and it's called uh, the Multi Hyphen Method. Hmm. And it's basically about designing um, your own working life. You know, sort of shifting your priorities when you need to, reinventing yourself side hustles using multiple kind of skill sets um and I, and I thought this this is this is you mm. this is kind of what what you've what you've done you know kind of like over the years you know um you know using the you know the different kind of skill sets that you've got you know working out you know when it's right to be you know sort of musician do your kind of software your computer science and things like that um mm. that must have created like an incredible um uh, you know, kind of range of skills and mindsets for you. What, what, what were your, your sort of formative influences for, um, you know, for the, for the way that you've kind of thought about, thought about life, I guess. Yeah. One of my earliest memories is that question that all children are asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And mm. I had a definite influence of, there were just, People in my life that I'd say, like, I want to be a veterinarian because I loved animals. And they would say things like, well, that's a lot of school. Mm. And, just, and I remember being young and just thinking, why are you ruining this? Like, what yeah. part of your power trip are you ruining it? I mean, I didn't have that wording, <laughs> of course, but like just that feeling. 
And I can remember very distinctly at about age nine or 10, maybe 11, you know, right, mm. like right when the brain is, is like, you know, questioning, um, thinking uh, in why am I picking one thing to be? Like what part of, why can't I be a sailor and a ballerina? Mm. Like yeah, what about yeah. so conflicting that I couldn't be both? And I grew up in, you know, I grew up in the 60s and 70s when you were really just one thing. But one of yeah. my really super lucky things that happened to me when I was little was I was adopted. And mm. my parents always told me I was adopted and they wanted me to, to interface with other kids that were adopted. And um, so that it would just be some kids are adopted and some kids aren't, you know, there was never, I never felt like an outsider because of yeah. it. Yeah. Really with having me play with other kids that were adopted. So what happened with that was I played with other kids who might have two moms or I play mm. with other kids that, you know, had different complexions and, and cultural backgrounds. So it was, I was exposed to a type of diversity yeah. early on that identified with love and family and not sexual identity and not racial identity. Mm. Mm. So I think that that was one very formative thing where I was like, we can be diverse. So when I was into the school system where I was faced with kind of this mm. single direction, very traditional school system. Yeah. Kind of have this like, what is going on? Like yeah. why is everybody the same? Why is it homogenized in my class? Yeah. Yeah. But not just why is it homogenized? Why are all the five-year-olds together and the 12-year-olds are together? Like, yeah. So I always had that questioning kind of thing. And then through, you know, experiences, I eventually <clears throat> couldn't go to school anymore. And I had no interest in school around the ninth grade. And my father put me into homeschooling. Mm, so mm. that being very self-directed. And I all of a sudden saw that there were, instead of just what was fed to me, I kind of had choices on direction. So when they said, you have to take a math class, which was always traumatic to me to take a math class or a science class. I was the kid that was like at, at 13 going, I'm not dissecting a frog. Yeah, and I was yeah. in a system that failed you in science. Like I couldn't, I didn't have a, I didn't have an entry into the sciences or into math because mm. it was not, you know, uh, acceptable. So I did have like homeschooling until the, what we call the 12th grade in the U S which is right. like 16, 17, right before you're going to move forward into like a bigger institutionalized education. Mm. And uh, it was great for me. It, I flourished under it. So my, yeah, social, yeah. my school life were very separate. I understood different groups. Um, I understood having, you know, that a person can wear many hats in their life. You know, like mm. you have family life, you can have work life, you can have school life. It's funny those those kind of formative influences, isn't it? You know, sort of back in your in, in your childhood, and and you know what you said about, you know, the first question you remember is, you know, what do you want to be? Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, kind of like when you, when you get to school or you get to a certain age in sort of school, usually like, in, in, you know, in the UK, it's usually, you know, kind of around about 10 or 11. That's pretty much kicked out of you. You, you know, any of that, that kind of imagination. It's like, well, what do you imagine? What would you love to be? Oh, I want to be, you know, uh, an astronaut. I want to be a musician, whatever. You get to school and then it's like all about, you know, kind of like sort of, this this kind of regimented you know set of lessons and, and kind of things that you you have to learn and then so this is the the traditional thing and then you know kind of like then you sort of follow follow your career and kind of that's what what what, what i got you really didn't didn't get that i didn't you, you get got that. Out of that right but there were other parts of it that became it's like you're really talking about you know developing skills to just show up yeah and just do the work those are mm. two things I had to learn later in life. It became very difficult for me to just show up and just do the work when I didn't yeah. want to do the work. Or being able to create a bigger picture and knowing, uh, you know, I, I, stay, I ended up staying very small picture, which is kind of part of what led to using drugs because drugs mm. are a very small picture, right? They're very immediate, satisfying. Yeah. They, they give desire a drive. And, mm. um, you know, so it became problematic. So I always, uh, you know, the only looking at, I don't have kids. Do you have kids? Yeah, I've got two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I don't have children. So clearly I'm an expert. And I look at... <laughs> um, 
And, uh, you know, I really do see the uniqueness in personality and how, um, you know, different kids are just going to respond, even in the same family, are just going to respond to like different stimulus or different ways to educate or different ways to create discipline. You know, I always said, I wish my parents made me sit down at a piano for 15 minutes, three times a week and made me learn piano. Like I had those oh my parents gosh. like, oh, maybe it's just not your thing. Move on to something else. So uh, you know, did, it help? did it hurt? Did it help at certain points and not others? What uh, so you see, so for me, so when I was, um, what, when I was eight, nine, um, I started playing a musical. I started playing the cello when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. That was my thing. Classic, classically trained. You know, I kind of went through, did all the all the kind of grades, and I was made. I mean, uh, I'm I'm using those words. I was made because that's what it became. It became a fucking mm-hmm. chore. Then I was sat down and I had to do this, you know, kind of regimented practice. When all I wanted to do was play with my mates and listen to punk rock. Sure. And I couldn't, I could, I, 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 I did it because I'm an, I'm an only child and I did it because I had the, um, I didn't, I didn't, I, I, I felt the spotlight when I was a kid and I didn't want to, you know, kind of upset the apple cart. So I carried on doing it, but eventually that, that pressure kind of told. And I just, one day I think I was like 16. I just like, ah, I'm not doing it anymore. Mm-hmm, not mm-hmm. doing it. Yes, and do you wish and they now? Made now, compromise? well, actually, last so last year, I I picked it up towards the end of last year. I picked it up again. Uh, not last year, in two, the end of two thousand and nineteen. I picked it up again. I went back. I went into a shop in in Soho, in London, and uh, and picked one up and asked the guy. I said, "Can I just have a play? I've not played it for thirty years. Can I have a play and see see what it's like?" And it was like all these memories came flooding back. Isn't it crazy? The mind ah. is so incredible. It, what a machine we have in our heads. It was unbelievable. Amazing. You know, just sometimes that happens to me too. And they'll be like, um, I don't know if this, this happened to you, but it's like, you know, the mind bolts together all these different. So like you have the audio and you have the feeling, the haptic and you have the, yeah. and I mean, I would, I'll do something. I recently, for me, it was mathematics. I took mm. a, I wanted to do a finite algebra class last year. And I sat down and I was working and all of a sudden, like, all these memories came back of television shows that were on while I was doing homework 30 <laughs> years ago. Like, why would I have memories of Star Trek and Jean-Luc Picard saying T, Hurl, you know, like just old, <laughs> old memories and how it's all like, all bolted together based yeah. on what survival, I guess. Survival, yeah, yeah. You know, where, where, when do the berries grow? When do we go pick them? How are the big animals not going to kill us? Where are the animals yeah. we can kill? It's all there. That it's all bolted in to modern memory. It's, 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 so it's, how'd you do on your cello when playing? It's rusty. But it's but it's it's still it's still there. I can still. I mean, I got I got through to um, you know kind of grade eight, sort of in the UK, which is basically like the top grade. You know, I could do it. Um, I just I just didn't. It was probably the you know the environment and probably just the, the the you know the feeling that I was being kind of constrained. It wasn't my choice. It didn't feel like it was my choice to do it um, at the time. But doing it of my own accord going back and thinking about it and, and and sort of picking it up it was kind of it was kind of interesting it was nice it was a nice feeling i've got to say and um you, you know you start i started to think you know maybe you know what what if you know things might have been different if, I, if i'd have had a different if i'd have had a different mindset then if i'd been more open-minded at the time Mm-hmm. If I hadn't felt like I was under sort of pressure to do it, if I felt like I could do it my own way, I don't know. Th- those sort of feelings came back. It's interesting. You know. Did your parents ever talk to you about pursuing it through upper education or professionally? Oh, they they um, oh, did. We talk about it professionally. I mean, they were they were really upset when I gave it up. Really upset. 
mm-hmm. you know, and like, you, you know, my, my dad, especially because he was, this was his thing. He was kind of classically trained himself as well. Oh, um, you know, and, you know, to be fair, you know, they put a lot of time into it, you know, sort of taking me to practice and, you know, I would, I played in the, the or- in an orchestra and stuff like that. Um, so they, they, they had a, a reason to do it, but um, yeah, um, we did, we did, we did talk about that. Yeah. We did talk about, you know, taking it further, but I, I, I was too close minded to, to do it. I think I associated it with them. Mm-hmm. You know. Did you go on to university or? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah. What, was your, what did you major in? I, st- I, st- I studied in, I studied accountancy. Oh, good. I, hated that. I got it. I got, I, I got it. But I, I know. You were just like, I'm not going to play cello because that's not punk rock enough. However, accounting. Doesn't make any sense, does it? There's a lot it's of like things that don't make sense. Side or the business side, or the a uh, bit of bit of everything, but a bit of economics, law, yeah, like, you know, then then the and then the you know kind of math side of it, which I really didn't like. But um, yeah, um, with with your with your kind of you know experience, you know the the um. I'm thinking about you know, kind of like your your adapt your, your your own kind of mindset, your 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 the courage that that you developed or that you had to kind of do those sort of different things. And you mentioned about you know learning things later on in life. How did how did that feel when you were doing that? Or you know, kind of what was the what was the kind of the genesis of if you thinking I, I I need to do this? Yeah, I don't think that there was really any. Um... There, it, there certainly wasn't a clear path for that. And it was mm. definitely um, messy and um, outrun. But there was a kind of concept in the 90s of this idea of sort of being a digital nomad that that, that mm. technology was going to come up and it was it would be important to be a part of it. I've been an avid gamer since I've been little. I've been in the digital space since, you know, early 80s. I went yeah. to San Francisco State for computer science and things like message boards and the idea of what later became, I'm going to say HTML, which are construct languages, things we look at when we look mm. at computers was always fascinating to me, almost in a, maybe a hobbyist kind of way. And then mm. L, L7 needed a bass player. So I kind of yeah. left and then revisited it in the 90s in the of being a musician and understanding, I mean, the first thing was that understanding that I wasn't necessarily a musician, but I was a content provider, that it was about yeah. lifestyle and personality and writing and doing all these things. So, I mean, the first thing I did was build my writing skills, which I think was yeah. completely lost at some point and communication mm. skills, like I said, and uh, always have been important. But back then, the only books I can remember like kind of dipping into would have been um, Franklin Covey's What Matters Most was really, yeah. really influential. Like the idea of like, you know, having this list to do list, but what what are my values in life and being able to yeah. establish my values and start to make to do lists based on my values and what matters totally. most. And yeah. then you know, yeah. Paris's four hour work week was like, for me, like it was just, what a different way to look at product and 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 depersonalize because the thing that comes came up through punk rock with me was this very personal hang on integrity drive all these really great attributes but sometimes it made it really difficult to just wake up and say you know i need to make 40 bucks today or i can't pay my yeah. my uh, electric you know, and, and where is all that? Like as an artist, it's all like ideas and like it's not the production side. And as a musician growing up through the 80s and 90s, you're reliant on other people to be your creator. You're, you know, mm. you co-create with people that have the tech side and that division is very, was very apparent, which is not mm. something completely different now. You know, mm. the idea that you're your own producer, editor, you're your own, you know, you run your podcast as the engineer and as the, I don't want to say, you know, the personality. Yeah. 
so you you kind of like went from you know kind of collaborating you know with your kind of co-creation you know kind of working with others to then think okay i need to there's some things that i'm going to have to do myself right, and then you've been you, draw that's a, that's long, a lot yeah right over time and but then I've you've always been, been the person i joined l7 because i wanted to be a co-creator with other yeah. writers uh, and other musicians uh, that's why you join a band you know yeah uh, as a songwriter singer it's why you would join a band instead of doing a solo project. Right? Doing a solo project, yeah, yeah. You, that it's it is that the uh, the messiness of co-creation and the the compromises and the successes and the things that you build together. Mm. I've always been a huge community builder, and I've saw that in punk rock. What it means to be a community builder before I ever looked at art history and looked at like what the dataists or the surrealists or people who really came yeah. up to the community. So, I mean, all modern art, really. I mean, that, that, that's an interesting one. The, 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 so you, you mentioned you, you've been part of this kind of like on, you've been doing, doing online gaming as well. So that's obviously very, very kind of community focused as well. You know, it's about about community. Mm-hmm. And, and also like with, um, I guess, kind of, you know, sort of software as well. You know, that, that's, you know, very kind of community based as well. So th- th- that, that must have... Um, you know, kind of been been very appealing to sort of then come, you know, after after L7 to then sort of come back to that. Yeah, literally, I had to think that people don't even, you know, we, software's like, eh, boring, boring. But, you know, while we were having the DIY movement of punk rock in the 70s, we were having software DIY, open source software communities. Yeah. People were saying, yeah. why would Microsoft or Apple, these big businesses, why would it be top funnel down? Why don't yeah. we all together create software that all together we could use, all together we could develop. Mm. You know, so I've always been a big, you know, and I still work with open software today. I still support the communities as best I can. And I still, you know, when I'm working with clients today, recommend open source software first as solutions for their their companies because because yeah. (laughs) I mean that I mean that kind that kind that kind of concept, you know, in in itself is kind of experimental and it's it's kind of innovative you know the you know the online communities you um you know you innovate that's that's where you kind of get some real kind of human connection and mm-hmm. sort of power to innovate that's where where a lot of the creation comes from you know in those those sort of communities i mean i i i've been um involved in um uh, an arts lab with mm-hmm. um you know it's based on the kind of like the the arts lab of arts labs of the sixties, you know, formed by by Jim Haynes. Um, it's actually with with youth, um, and uh, you know, we were talking to youth the, the, the other day, and we've done a like a magazine, put a you know, we've kind of created this this sort of magazine, and it's it's incredible that we've we've done this pretty much remotely. So we did this like within within kind of lockdown, and it's like a basically like a community of people that kind of come together who have the same values and I think you, you mentioned values earlier and I think that's like I agree that's like hugely important you know having the same kind of values to sort of come together with the same you know kind of objectives and kind of create this this incredible you know kind of piece of work mm-hmm. I think it's just like hugely powerful that, that people can kind of do that now you know these sort of collaborations that are sort of coming, uh, you, you know, are, are, are kind of a, kind of ex- I find it quite exciting. Mm-hmm. I was doing some doing some some writing as well about, and I was reading an example of um, uh, this this kind of community collective um, called the Georgia Street uh, Community Collective in Detroit, and it was about you know kind of regenerating, um, you know, kind of like a, a, a district in in Detroit that become very kind of derelict. And again, just seeing the again, the, you know, you know, people kind of bound by values. I thought was just like just really, really kind of exciting and powerful that, that people can kind of come together and do that. Mm-hmm. You know, um, yeah. Um, what about um, you, you? You mentioned earlier about um, about kind of ages, you know, kind of coming together or not coming together. I think like like with. Um, Social media, for example, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of competition, you know, and, um, you know, people are trying to stand out, you know, trying to differentiate themselves. 
Um, but to me, there seems there's a lot of stuff that's sort of variations on a theme. That, that, that there's few kind of really different different sort of things going on and breaking new ground. I mean, do you, what do you think? Do you think it's harder to differentiate differentiate yourself these days? I mean, I I, I don't worry too much about that. I've mm. always been a person that is going to um, really look deep into what I'm, you know, I believe in the authentic self, but I know that yeah. other people will do, you know, I've worked on, you know, on marketing campaigns to see what's mm. going to provide the most clicks. I've excused myself from that mindset. So, and I don't know if that's, I don't know a, a I, I mean, I, I think I grew up with legacy media, right? And then yeah. legacy media did the same thing and legacy media was a little bit more controlled and legacy media didn't have the kind of like open doors that say social media mm. does now. But I think that there was always the intention that social media would not take the place of legacy media, but they would yeah. kind of exist. And I think it's in, that's sort of one of the unfortunate mm. things, at least that has happened in the United States. We don't have... Uh, state-funded media anymore mm. than we used to. So there tends to be, I don't know, we could totally get into it, but. <laughs> yeah. The question was, you know, do I, do I personally feel pressure? Or what's my opinion on clickbait or like being yeah. able to entice? There's always, that's always been it from, you know, classical Greek sculptures, idealizing the athletic male body to mm. now you know, to what the male or female body needs to look like now. Like it just mm. hasn't changed. So if we don't change the core issue, it doesn't matter if there's social media or legacy media. Mm. We're still looking mm. at idealizations and we're still feeding desire to people to make money from them and by mm. exposing, you know, their desire to be different. Mm. Mm. And it's whether you're doing it in, you know, with mindset training, or you're doing it with the cover of Men's Health magazine featuring an airbrushed <laughs> man in the 40s who has the body of a 22 year old. You yeah, know, you're yeah. like, okay, uh, you know, that's whatever. That's the same thing Augustus did. Like, I have, a, now I have a 22 year old body. Look at this. <laughs> it's like, okay, dude. Do you think? Do you think there could be? Do you buy it? <laughs> Do you, do you think there could be there could be sort of more, you know, collaboration across age groups? Do you think yeah, the, the, the one thing like uh, that has really uh, I have seen as I'm going to problematize it is that events have been at least in the prior to COVID mm. uh, events have been ageist and have been age restricted, mm. and. Uh, it's interesting to kind of watch that. And, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a rock music chick and I like going to live shows. And so I see it, like there's less age groups. There's bars and events and yeah. types of events that now attract age groups. So it's interesting. Mm. I'd noticed the, the, the um, you know, for, for the music singer, maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's the, the, Sort of scene that I go to in in particular in, in London, um, quite a, quite a wide range of of ages, you know, mm. kind of going to going to well, you know. You some... and I do. You and I do. I mean, yeah. it also attracts multi generations. So multi generations. Yeah. I'm not going to think that like when I go buy a ticket to a show, I, that experience is not the experience. Mm. I generally see. Also, I when I go see legacy groups, yeah, I do see multi generational. But yeah, when those bands stop touring, yeah, you know what I mean that. Yeah, <laughs> at a certain point. Yeah, um, yeah. I think. I, I mean, it's it, you know the. You know the question of, of of kind of like aging and how I think like you know how I mean you've done you, you've done you know a lot of kind of marketing and branding, right? And um, you know I think some you know sometimes like the way that products are, are marketed, certain age groups kind of, kind of like you know almost like compartmentalizing people based on I don't know oh, what the, what, the, what the company wants to produce, what the company thinks the 
individuals want. I mean, it really is apparent in how our Google's ads are structured, right? Because yeah. depending on like what I search, I'm going to get fed certain advertisements. Yeah. And for me, just every once in a while, I have to go search like luxury vehicles or private jets just to like upgrade <laughs> my level of advertising because I don't want to see hair loss and yeah. like, yeah. oh gosh, am I fat now? I don't want to see that. <laughs> you know, because that's, you know, everyone's just looking for my pain. I want to tell them, here's my pain. I just want to be a rich, crazy person that wants to click on your ads. So like, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want to see retirement homes in Arizona. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. You don't know me. <laughs> it's like, where the fuck are you getting this from? <laughs> oh, seriously. I mean, in the old days when it was completely like on, I mean, Google, I, I would, I, I was talking to a friend, I guess, like their, their parents were looking for a property. Like they wanted an, what we're we're going to call an adult living situation, which is yeah. like restricted to 55 and up communities. Yeah. So I started to talk to my friend about it in email and literally was just get, we're getting the ads. I mean, it was so yeah. direct and uh, yeah. I was just like, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what can I, you know, what, who's out there advertising right now <laughs> making this worth it and what ads can I see depending on what I talk about in my email? <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to go and stick my head out of the window. Motor, you know, like <laughs> acne, acne. God, my acne is so bad today. And just see what, <laughs> see what happens. Yeah. For, for like a lot of, a lot of people, I think that, the, the, you know, the, you know, they kind of like have a default. The, the default setting is to sort of play it safe. You is know, it? kind of keep the status quo. I think so. Especially as you get older. I think, I think so. Interesting. Because I feel that the default setting is for peace. People want peace. Want peace. They want to experience serenity and peace. And that's what they work for. Does, does, that, does, that, does, that, does that equate to playing it safe? Like, or do you, do you think... It, I think people have natural bolted in fears, anxieties, and worry. I agree. It's bolted in when you're a little kid because like you have to scare your children. Yeah. I like to say it's the Parmesan story. I don't know if you have any stories like this, but when I was little, I loved Parmesan and I had like an aunt or somebody that said, Parmesan's going to give you worms if you eat too much of it. (laughs) Really at some point in my twenties, I was like putting Parmesan on my food and I was with someone and they put too much and I go, Oh my God, you're going to get, (laughs) right as I said it, I was like, oh, I fell for that. I can't believe I fell for it and believed it up until maybe 26 years old. Oh my. My mind. So yeah. And and it's like those fears, those worries, those, that rumination, those pieces that we get that, you know, have to reevaluate continuously through our lives to see what works and what doesn't work. And Mm. ultimately, fear is seeking is peace. Mm. I think that my, you know, my auntie was seeking not having to spend so much money on Parmesan because it was more expensive. <laughs> she thought fear, you know, or she thought about salt levels or she thought about over consumerism, but it was based in fear and then passing that fear on to me yeah. as a child for, to, for me to control my desires. Right. And wow. then as an adult, what do we do? You know, usually between 18 and 26, we have to figure out what works and what doesn't. Yeah. And usually we're having kids at the same time. So <laughs> never, like, those chains never break. And I find I'm sitting with my, my own nieces, you know, my niece and nephews, and we're like mm. walking across the street and I have a very bolted in fear of children just running into the street. Yeah. And I feel yeah. that fear and I understand that fear is for me to protect them and then I say things like you know that sidewalk's made of lava and we can't step on it. <laughs> ah! and, then, and then they look at me and they go you are such a mini you are a mini and I'm like Aunt mini I know so I get it I get where it comes from but mm. if I'm afraid to cross the street because of lava I gotta look at that as an adult Mm-hmm. 
Because it seems have, if I don't cross the street, I'm peaceful. I'm, it, I'm, uh, if I don't, if that fear doesn't come up, I experience peace. Mm. I'm having to think about that one. I know, right? It, yeah. It's an interesting one. My, where my, where you might be working with mindset, I love to work with emotion. I think that emotion mm. is like this sacred experience of like our higher selves communicating with our logic mind. Mm. You know, our logic mind keeps us secure and safe and tells us things are dangerous and tells us to worry. And we have to subvert that. And emotions can be great cues for that. So I had to, um, I did a, um, I did a master's about four years ago. And one of the one of the um, one of the sessions, it was about it was a, the, the 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 purpose of the exercise was to um, was about coming to consensus where you've got you know different views about how you how a group of people come to a consensus. And it started off that the um, the tutor gave us a question, and it was one of those you know kind of math questions that you know somebody goes into a shop and they want to buy a pair of shoes. The shoes cost this amount of money. The person buying them has only got, you know, like a 20 pound note, 40, 50 pound note. The shopkeeper has to go and get some change, comes back. What change does he end up with and all that? One of those little mind twisters. My, mm -hmm. even, even though I studied accountancy, my mind is not geared up for that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and, and, and the, and the, um, the tutor well, said, on, no. you're not just, you're not the person in the group that says, leave the shop, go somewhere oh, else. God. Oh, God. Like, oh my God. And I must have had panic. He said, you've got a minute to solve this. I had panic all over my face. Right. And this is, you know, I'm like 48 years old at the time and I've got panic all over my face. And he said, what I'm going to do, he said, I'm going to get five people, I'm going to choose five random people and you're going to come down to the front with your answers, tell everybody what your answers are and then come to an agreement as to what you think the correct one is. That's your consensus building, right? Okay. So of course I have panic over my face and I get picked and go down. Anyway, we come out. Of course my answer was wrong. We do, we do the exercise. And, and at the end he says, um, do you know, um, he said, I've out of this group of 35, eight of you got it right. And I went down there thinking I was the only one that had got it wrong. <laughs> I was just like, oh my God, eight of us got it right, you know. And that's, you know, you kind of self belief, you know, you kind of feel like you're saying about your fear and anxiety. So a lot of the time is ill founded. And it's kind of like gives you, gives you this kind of inertia. Fear is energy. Fear is it's energy. Fear, it's energy to solve problems. So if, if you were to it's energy to go run after the kid when the kid runs into the road, it's the energy to solve the problem. Yeah, yeah. Anxiety is just energy. It's a good way to look at it. Yeah, I had a, I did a really huge piece on it. Like I, you know, what I'm a performer, and I would getting I was getting incredible stage fright, and I was mm. medicating the stage fright with cigarettes, food. Mm about it over and endlessly going to therapists like medicating 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 and um one of my mentors just said maybe you just need you feel like you need energy to get on stage it's a lot of work yeah so we're out there maybe your body's just prepping you for the experience and i'm just like oh well there's a different way to look at it different way no. to look at it no you're wrong okay maybe you're right so yeah. kind of like so, so like fear fear is fear then of the anxiety was the emotion that you needed to give you the strength to get on stage. Yeah, and I mean, really like some of the work that I've done is really about separating the story from the feeling, right? And mm. separating emotion from feeling. What is physical mm. um, emotion? What is, what is the story your brain is telling you about the emotion? Because we define it, right? I'm just like, mm. I'm scared to present stuff in class and I don't want to be wrong. And yeah. if I'm wrong, I'm going to look bad. And if I look bad, I'm a dude and I'm told I'm never ever supposed to look bad. So yeah. therefore I have fear. You know, when you can start to just say, I have fear and remove the story, you can start looking at it in a different perspective. You have many perspectives to look at it. Removing the story. Separating the emotion from the story. And that's a lot of work that I do with um, my, my, the women, uh, the people that I work with when they come in and they say like, 
this guy at work told me to put my mask on and like my mask was on and then the thing wasn't down and then I'm just really met and you know and then it's like well where's the story in that and where is like can you just feel embarrassed and then mm. if you feel embarrassed is it uh, embarrassment is a story we tell ourselves right the root of that is it feeling shameful or feeling guilty do you just simply feel guilty that you weren't perfect in that moment and someone else scolded you and now you feel guilty and now you're turning it into embarrassment mm. and then you're turning it into how all the you know rules at work are wrong you yeah. know? <laughs> And kind of just backing it right down to like a core feeling. And is, it, is this something that, that people need to continually, co you know, teach themselves and practice to, to do this? You know, I, I feel it is. I was literally in, um, a, a, you know, I'm in a woman's group on Monday nights and somebody mm. was talking like sort of about the same thing that they were with a, a client and the client hung up on them, right? Or something <laughs> like so bizarre. And everyone in the group was just like perked up and they were like, you have to set boundaries. You can't let clients do that. And I was the one in the group that was like, who cares? Let them have their experience. It has nothing to do with you that they hung up. Yeah, yeah. It literally has nothing to do. It's 100% their experience. You know, I'm the one that's like, you stop here, they start there. And I think that that, you know, and I'm just like, why do I feel different? And then again, why am I not in the group of, you know, boss ass women that are like boundaries, bleh, bleh, make it happen, you know? And then I'm just like, you know, people perceive of me as like this badass, right? That like set standards and I'm not, I'm just like, I'm kind of just like, it doesn't, whatever. Like, who cares? And like, how did I become like that? You know, and I woke up this morning, I do writing every morning. Yeah. And I, and I knew I should have been focusing on what we were going to talk about today. But at the same time, I was like, you know, I, I didn't feel alienated. I didn't feel different. I felt it was okay to have a different opinion. I literally created space in the argument while everyone was getting all riled up to just say like, <laughs> hey, here's a different experience. It's mine, whatever you guys want to do with it. I felt all their energy just go, but we're mad. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, I love you. I can't wait to see you next Monday. And then I went and wrote about it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I think there, 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 there seems to be um, a, the, 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 there's more that's being written about, you know, kind of like the unique self, you know, and, and being comfortable sort of in, in you know, with, with who you are you know, kind of this, this, you know, I, I don't know if it's a, if it's a sort of saying, but go with the floor, you know, you kind of yeah. go with it and you just like try and let this kind of water just sort of flow over you, you know, and you make mistakes, you might not do things the accepted way, but so what, you know, that, that in a way is kind of disassociated. I think that's a really good way to, you know, kind of look at it. And, and, you know, I hope that maybe, maybe that's the, this is becoming a more, you know, kind of like accepted way, you know, that, that you are unique and you can be yourself and not so much. And I used to, I used to, you know, kind of think, worry like so much about what other people thought of me. Mm -hmm. I used, to, mm -hmm. used, to, used to, to almost like just drove me nuts. Sure. Sometimes the way that I would think about it, you know, and I'm, I'm teaching myself to stop doing that. I'm much better at it now. Sure. But we have to also know that this is the, what we're talking about is a privilege in our society as our society moves forward. Like mm. if we were both dock workers, which that's my other career choice. Yeah. There's no room for that. There's no yeah. room for self-experimentation and like, Oh, I don't feel so, I don't feel good. Like talking about, you know, I mean, you just really, you know, it's just, that's, it, it's just set up differently, but, Mm. I, I, I really do feel like uh, the flexibility is a skill set, but mm. also not being flexible is a skill set too. And mm. both of them are, it's not what's good or bad. It's just what serve us, what serves us. So well, 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 never identify something as this is the bad way, this is the good way. What, what way would you say that being inflexible is 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 good or is that just dependent on the individual you know if, if they feel that inflexibility is good then 
Yeah, I mean, if you're, you know, living, like, I think that the United States, I don't know how it's going in Europe right now or the UK, but in the <laughs> United States, we are at this division point that we have always been at this division point, which is urban versus farmer. And even yeah. though our urban areas are not necessarily the way <clears throat> it used to be, and certainly our fire farmers aren't, it's still the mentality. It's the um, self-sustaining mentality that was set up when our country was set up of this idea that you go, you have a farm, you know, what you do every day decides whether you and your family eat at night, period. Like what you grow, what you hunt, what you do. And all of that is very romanticized because the reality is it doesn't really work. But also the urban and industrialization part of it comes with its own mentality of um, its own mindset. And if you look at a map in the United States of what's red and what's blue, which is how we somehow want to define ourselves. <laughs> that's, like, that's a whole other conversation, but dude, how funny is that gonna look in like a yeah. hundred years? How hilarious is it gonna look that clearly the less populated areas are red and the more populated areas are blue, are blue. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it's like, it's really this like idea of like, are we gonna re rely on an Uber state? And I'm not saying anything's right or wrong, you know, our, federal government versus yeah. our local governments. And that's what yeah. it's like, really? Okay. We just went through four years of someone that completely subverted that system in the most bizarre mm. way possible, only to leave enforcing that system more. Yeah, yeah. I'm a defund the presidency person. I'm like, we don't need yeah. a president. We lost the privilege. We, too fo we focused on it. We didn't focus on local politics. We didn't focus on what we needed to. The guy sucked the attention out of us. And now we're all post-traumatic. So what's now what? <laughs> yeah. We, we, need to have a, we need to have another conversation on the future. <laughs> like, we're not even looking at any <laughs> alternate systems or maybe <laughs> adjustments to the system. Like, the, okay. We have a good guy in and a bad guy or a bad guy and a good guy. That's, the, oh, that's how we're going to look at it. Mm. Okay. There's there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's an interesting movement that that sort of took off in the in the UK. Um, just sort of quickly, I'm conscious of time, but um, uh, not in the UK, in in Europe, uh, called uh, it's sort of run on Twitter. There's a, it, it's called Demo democratizing work, and it's about um, you know, you know giving employees sort of more representation that um, you know employees are considered as as um, you know. Um, you know, kind of assets of the of the company, and, and and it's about you know, kind of like increasing the, um, you know, the say that employees have that you know, so then it's the, it's the same kind of rationale as as how government is structured. You know that, uh, um, you know, and and this is this is about, you know, the way that decisions are made. You know, the strategic decisions of companies are made without consulting you know employees. And there's got to be a better way, you know, for companies to be run because ultimately they still don't run the right way. Of course. And that's, that's maybe for another Which day. I say, happy life, happy wife, which is an old expression that says, if you keep your wife happy, your life will be happy, which is really basically saying, keep your slaves well fed. Yeah. And they will be very productive for you. And I'm not saying there's an alternative to it, but we know if the employees are under the illusion of happiness, listen to me, I'm really using some like hardcore words. If your employees are happy, they're going to be more productive to suit the business's overarching needs. This is why you need to be a business coach. You need to get into the business coaching. I know, but I don't believe, I don't think, I don't I think we're all just in the matrix and it doesn't matter anyway. No. <laughs> You know, it's felt absolutely safe for me to do in the last week. Go on. Absolutely safe because this was never safe. Just go watch Alex Jones and see what he says. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I just, I'm throwing that out there. Everybody listening is now going to go and watch Alex Jones. That's the, that's the word. If you don't know who Alex Jones is, he's an American commentator who is very histrionic in personality. Yeah. And 
was at one time just considered an out there voice, mm. but then seemed to inform an entire movement in society of like how to be paranoid. But ultimately he was selling what he sold products. He, he created the pain and sold products to solve the pain. So yeah. if you really want to see some amazing um, marketing. Alex Jones. And I don't know if he meant, he might believe what he says. I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> but he literally is like, the water is poison. You're poisoning your babies. I can sell a water filter on my store. It's your only solution. <laughs> So Jennifer, just any, <laughs> any, any, just you a, a can last word. You edit all of that out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keeping it all in. It's I, mean, all I, I feel like I went down a rabbit hole that could be severely misunderstood if you don't know my sense of, you know, because you got to laugh to keep from crying. That's absolutely, crying. absolutely right. I, I, I think everybody will understand that. Um, any, any, just a, a last word of, from you on, um, you know, anybody that, that's, looking to make any sort of change, you know, in their life, um, you know, to get that peace, as you say, just looking for, you know, about how to sort of work out their, their values, but he's finding this, this kind of mental block, this obstacle to sort of overcome anything you want to, any piece of advice. It's interesting. I mean, because a lot of times we look at unmanageability as the indication of what's happening. Either we're not making enough money or we're too heavy or we're, we're ultimately unhappy. Mm. Um, and there's always going to be somebody that's going to sell you some kind of recipe that's going to at least maybe temporarily fix that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But really, I feel that there's work that can be done. And the only way that I know that works to structure it is to either go professionally and really work on some of that stuff, work mm. on you know, your core values, work on your response system, work on how you think, um, and build a community around you of people that aren't just gonna be cyclophants, people that you really feel safe with yeah. them saying, look, I see something going on with you are you okay? How can I support you? Or, and, and vice versa, that you're able to do that with them. I think that that, for me, that was a big piece. I know everyone doesn't have that, but it's something to kind of move towards. I think morning writing and learning to write mm. helps being able to do that. I think that a lot of the, uh, one of the like core adjustments that could be made is in understanding that this is just a computer that was programmed, that you're uh, how you identify and look at your life really is in your thinking. And it's mm -hmm. not just as easily as meeting against it. Like you can't just think like, I always, I don't like my appearance or <clears throat> I, 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 and I, I don't know, like I, I, I'm just trying to pick something that people like, um, I can't find love in my life. So mm -hmm. it isn't like you can just sit and think I have, you know, like you really need to look at some of like the core thinking in mm -hmm. that. And I think things like meditation help. Yeah, um, if yeah. you're a religious person, yeah, yes, do go go to your church if you if that's what you have, or if mm -hmm. you are a meditation person, go see meditation. And I think like body mind stuff helps because it subverts the thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then other stuff, listening to music subverts the thinking. Playing yeah, music, yeah, yeah. thinking, but it'll come back. You know, if you subvert it and don't try to bring in other concepts. Mm. you know i'm not exactly clear i you know i have a very clear path so it's hard for me to give advice to people that don't have a clear path with that yeah 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 and try different stuff try different stuff yeah i mean that, that's what that's what we've been trying to do i think that you know at least you know about the you know meditation you know going walking into the forest kind of connecting with nature and stuff like that you know the the these were kind of new things that were tried and it's just you know some of the experiences have been fantastic i mean re really you know just being able to sort of switch off and then think 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 a bit clearer you know you can think clearer without without all this this kind of like information coming in i think that's so that's a really good piece of advice to you know think of thing try things try things but let me tell also. you something that can happen in a person's life is I'm just going to call that a spiritual experience not because i'm religious or believe I have a spirit, but let's mm. just say it's not cognitive. 
So we're just, I'm just going to describe it as what it not it is, <laughs> mm. what it's not, if that makes sense. And I'm going to use yeah. some spiritual. Um, I found in my long life is that we're going to have times where we're not able to have access to music and we're not going to have access to nature and we're not going to have access to a yoga studio or access to a gym. It mm. could be because you're lying in a hospital bed. It could mm. be because financial circumstances have put you in a place where you don't have that. So one of the important things that I have developed is the ability to be anywhere with any experience in any circumstance and be able to not have a cognitive experience or let's call it a spiritual experience to be yeah. able to sit on a crowded bus, to be able to be in holding a holding tank at Heathrow because the work papers weren't right and I'm being deported and I have to spend three days in jail. Mm -hmm. Like you really have to be able to meet all circumstances in your life. And I think it's great. People say, I go to the gym and I run on a treadmill and I get to God and you know everything is mm -hmm. relieved and I make better decisions. And I'm just like, you know, I had a cancer diagnosis and yeah. that, that spirituality has to be right there when you're sitting with the doctor in that doctor's office. Yeah. And, and there's good news and bad news. Yeah. You know, right when you wake up from treatment and the anesthesia is wearing off, you know, that's when all of this work. That's is, the ultimate. Yeah. When you're giving birth. Yeah. Never, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The ultimate spiritual experience for a woman, not the only, but. Mm. you know there were that's where it i don't know where it comes into play right yeah yeah that's fantastic thank you so much thank you i'm thank excited you so much. to your business grow and follow what you do and the people you've helped yeah absolutely it's this, this has been amazing i mean really some i think some really fantastic um, you know, kind of insights and, and uh, you know, kind of talking points. I think it's been really great. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Great. Thank you so much. And, uh, right. yeah. Thanks for listening to the show. And I really hope that you enjoyed it and that you'll tune in for the next episode. In the meantime, it would be really awesome if you could rate and review the show and also share it with any friends who you think might enjoy it.